on international religious freedom, or USURF, has noted over the last couple of years, there has been a marked shift in the way that Egypt recognizes and discusses religious freedom challenges in the country. In years past, such as during the Mubarak presidency, Egypt generally refused to recognize any form of discrimination or challenges facing non-Muslims, blaming sectarian issues on terrorists or people with mental illness. The Sisi administration has changed the nature of this discourse, publicly acknowledging religious freedom challenges and making some incremental changes such as the church building law of 2016, which I'll discuss shortly. Two years ago, I was able to join some of my colleagues at the Cathedral of the Nativity in New Cairo as President Sisi opened it and continued his annual tradition of joining public masses. Um, while these actions were purely symbolic, they did represent a shift in public discourse that I know the Congressman um, mentioned earlier, especially important coming from the President himself. While USERF acknowledges these modest changes, Egypt still has a way to go in terms of truly establishing religious freedom in the country, not just for Coptic Christians, but for the Muslim majority and for smaller non-Muslim communities as well. So for that reason, USERF has continued to recommend Egypt for this spe special watch list at the State Department. So our overall concerns, um, which overlap are number one, um, sy systematic and ongoing discrimination, number two, sectarian violence, and number three, the overlap of legal repression and religious freedom violations. I will devote my remarks to discussing the first two of those areas and our recommendations that pertain directly to those. And then my use of colleague, Dr. Kurt Wirthmuller, will discuss some of our recent reporting and findings on that last issue. Regarding systematic and ongoing discrimination of Coptic Christians, we find that discrimination is in some ways one of the hardest issues to pin down in a country like Egypt, in which the Constitution and various laws suggest equality among citizens regardless of religion, including Article 53 of the Constitution. And yet the practical and enforced realities fall far short. Religious freedom advocates have long pointed to the proportionally poor representation of non-Muslims in official capacities, including the security and foreign affairs sectors, as well as in positions of high-ranking public office. There have been some key appointments in recent years, including Ms. Manal Mikhail um, as governor of Damyat in 2018, and Ms. Phoebe um, Fauzi as deputy speaker of the Senate just last month. These are modest advancements, but still important to recognize. The implementation of the church building law of 2016 provides a useful example of the ways in which discrimination appears in the Egyptian system. The law itself has been slow to implement. Since its passage in 2016, the Egyptian cabinet has approved around 1,800 of the 5,200 churches and church-related buildings that applied for registration. Yes, Egyptian bureaucracy is infamous for moving slowly, but that number represents only a third of all the applicants. While it is a positive thing, the President Sisi has ordered all new neighborhoods to include places of worship for both Muslims and Christians. The slow implementation of this law means that thousands of cops, mostly in villages scattered around Upper Egypt and the Nile Delta, have still have no legal place to worship. So two other issues plague this implementation that we really need to consider. The first is church registration is still substantially different and far less proportional to mosques in the country. Even with the current approved registrations, there are still roughly 250% more mosques than churches in proportion to the respective population of Muslims to Christians, even by a conservative estimate. Second, although the law stipulates that churches awaiting registration approval should remain open, there has been several incidents in the last two years in which mob attacks in rural areas have forced the long-term closure of such properties with no sign of the government stepping in to enforce this requirement. For example, in early 2019, in the village of Man Shayat in Zafarana, in the Minya province that I know has been problematic for a lot of these mob violent situations, um, uh, a, a Muslims were stirred to anger by over a local preacher, so they surrounded a church and started chanting threats and insults. The police responded, not by arresting those who threatened the church, but by closing the church. Thus joining the ranks of similarly closed churches in Minya province and elsewhere that the church building law technically mandated should remain open. In other words, while the church building law represents an improvement from the past in a way for unlicensed churches to be recognized, its implementation and enforcement, as well as the disparity between how churches and mosques are handled within this framework, falls far short of equality, not to mention true religious freedom. In terms of sectarian violence, fortunately, there has been a clear de decline in most severe instances of anti-Christian violence in comparison to the burning of dozens of churches by Muslim Brotherhood supporters in 2013, or the deadly attacks by ISIS remnants of Coptic 
pilgrims visiting in the mini area monasteries in 2018 and 2019. However, sectarian mob attacks in rural villages continue to plague Egypt's Coptic community. There were far fewer incidents in 2020, possibly because of widespread church and mosque closures for much of the year due to COVID-19 restrictions. But such attacks did occur early and late in the year. For example, in November, after rumors spread that a local Christian cattle farmer had insulted Islam in a Facebook post. Muslim villagers in Marsha near uh, Melawai attacked Coptic homes and the local Orthodox church, setting fire to some of the properties. It's important to note that while reports explain that Muslim neighbors came to help and offered refuge to some of the Christians fleeing the violence, when the police arrived, they arrested the attackers and the victims alike. Munia's chief of security did reportedly speak to villagers afterwards and warn them of the danger of this type of violence. But to our knowledge, none of the attackers, including whoever caused serious burn injuries to an elderly woman, have been charged with a crime. Finally, while I recognize the emphasis of this event is on conditions facing Christians in Egypt, I've always appreciated in defense of Christians' commitment to also draw attention to the circumstances of other religious and non-religious groups, because we all know that, that um, all minorities are, are, are impacted when any minority is being impacted. In Egypt, non-believers and atheists, Quranists, Baha'is, Shia Muslims, and others, especially former Muslims, often face serious societal or legal repercussions for publicly voicing their beliefs, or even sometimes privately for doing so. For example, in August, police arrested Rita Abdel Rahman, a scholar at El Azhar Institute in the town of Kafir Sakur in Sharkaya province for his teaching of Quranism, the belief that only the Quran, not prophetic traditions and other traditional sources as Sunni jurisprudence, should guide the lives of Muslims. Now, he is likely facing charges now of insulting religion, and which we see as part of a trend that Dr. Worthmuller will be discussing shortly. Rita Abdel Rahman's arrest should serve as an important reminder that as long as government authorities and prosecutors see themselves as arbiters, what people can and should believe and express, religious freedom will remain elusive in Egypt. In other words, the freedom of all religion communities in Egypt and those with no religion at all are intertwined and should be protected as such. The question remains as to how the above um, continues relates to use recommendations to the US government and how to best encourage the improvement for religious freedom conditions in Egypt. I wanted to um, close by highlighting these two sets of recommendations from our 2020 annual report that, that are, I, I, I really feel like are, they're very strong recommendations that, that would make a big difference if, if they were followed. The first is to urge the Egyptian government to cease the long-standing practice of seizing legal authority to customary reconciliation councils to resolve incidents of sectarian mob violence, um, repeal decrees banning Baha'is and Jehovah's Witnesses, remove religion from official identity documents, and pass laws consistent with Article 53 of the Constitution. The second is that the U.S. should allocate a portion of assistance to the U.S. Agency for International Development, or USAID, to reform public school curriculum and teacher training and to promote greater religious inclusivity throughout the country. In the first of these, as you can tell, combine several of the long-standing concerns USERF has in regard to how religious discrimination affects several different communities. Customary reconciliation councils, which are often invoked in response to sectarian mob attacks in rural areas, almost universally end with absolving the perpetrators of the violence of all responsibility and consequences. Furthermore, they often require victims to share the blame and in some cases does actually suffer punishment. Such, such as exiles from their homes and villages. USERF has long opposed this practice, and we continue to call on Egypt's judiciary to uphold the rule of law in response to these incidents. Instead of handling responsibility to the local majorities, Dr. Worthmuller will have some more to say on this subject momentarily. At the same time, as suggested above, the protection of religious, smaller religious minorities, such as Baha'is and Jehovah's Witnesses, is a crucial step to protecting religious freedom. It is our longstanding request to remove religion from national ID cards altogether an unnecessary requirement that opens the door to many forms of discrimination and which Egypt's own constitution of 2014 prohibits, according to Article 53. And finally, Yusuf is praised and continues to support the work of the Minister of Education in reforming public school curriculum to remove sectarian language and encourage inner religious respect and inclusivity. I had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Tariq Shaki, the current Minister of Education, and was impressed with his work in revised um, primary school textbooks we were allowed to see. We genuinely want his ministry to succeed in this significant undertaking. We therefore encourage its U.S. partners to find opportunities to support such curriculum development as well as grassroots programs to promote religious freedom and inclusivity among Egypt's youth. 
In closing, Yusuf fully understands that Egypt is a massive, populous, and complicated country, and that change comes very slowly. We appreciate the president's public engagement and the efforts our many friends in government who dialogue with us have made about these important issues. However, the pace of slow change can be no real excuse to avoid the sort of legal and social accountability, protection, and substantial reform that's needed to finally and truly end the serious and long-standing challenges and indeed threats that Coptic Christians have faced for many generations. Thanks so much.